Hello guys, this is Dr. Preeti Parekh. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm very excited for this interview of mine today with Dr. Rick Hansen. Dr. Hansen is a psychologist. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's also a senior fellow of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. Dr. Hansen's books are available in 28 languages and include Resilient, Hardwiring Happiness, Buddha's Brain, one of my favorites, Just One Thing, and Mother Nurture. He's the founder of the Wellspring Institute for Neuroscience and Contemplative Wisdom. He's been an invited speaker at Oxford, Stanford, Harvard, and other major universities, and has been featured on BBC, CBS, NPR, Radio New Zealand, and other major media. Hello, Rick. Hello there. Uh, may you. I call you Pretty? Yes, please. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming to my show. For uh, Thank you for coming to my channel. Yeah. I'm really excited to have you today. Oh, my pleasure. Um, you know, I was introduced to your work um, through your book, Buddha's Brain. Yes. And uh, that was the very first time I came to realize that it's possible to change our brain for better health and happiness. Oh, that's and, a good realization. And uh, now your fifth book has come out. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. And I'm finishing my sixth one oh, as dear. we speak. So <laughs> how did that happen? I don't know. Honestly. <laughs> Can't wait to read that. So your fifth book, Resilient, I just read it um, last week. Mm. Um, so Rick, tell me, what does resilient mean to you? It's, it's a hot topic these days. Um, yeah. so what does resilience mean to you? And is it something that we are all born with or is it something that can be developed? Uh, I think you're asking some of the most important questions of all for ordinary people in daily life, as well as for people like you and me who are professionals, who are helping people, uh, therapist, physician, we could add educators, coaches, other people, parents too. How do we help people? So I think of resilience, I'm going to answer the question in kind of three levels, right? Mm -hmm. The surface level is that resilience helps us survive the worst day of our life. It helps us get through a terrible day at the hospital, uh, a traffic accident, uh, six months in a combat tour in Afghanistan. Resilience helps us do that. Second, deeper level, resilience helps us thrive every day of our life because every day of our life we face challenges. Uh, before we began this interview, there was a little difficulty with the sound, and you had to deal with the challenge. How do you do that? How do you stay calm? How do you stay happy? Maybe around the edges you're a little pressured, a little frazzled, but in the core of your being, you're not uh, really upset about it. And we need that kind of resilience to assert ourselves with other people, to deal with problems that come up, like being stuck in a traffic jam late for a meeting, or deal with the material that surfaces into the mind from our own childhood, our own history. We need that kind of second level of resilience for everyday well-being and everyday functioning. Very, very important. Now, if all people care about is the first two levels, that's fine. And there's a deeper level. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, person hanging on the wall behind your head here. There's a deeper level here where it's possible to find a profound equanimity. That's the translation of a term in early Buddhism, as you know, upekka, Sanskrit as well. Um, and uh, that quality of equanimity is not apathy, it's not numb, it's responsive, it's full of love, and it's very peaceful and not swept away by the ancient machinery of craving, mm. broadly defined that leads to suffering and harm. So people can read my book at all three levels. They can think about, all right, what are the muscles I need to build to deal with you know, the things inevitably that come in a person's life, including things that happen to other people, like your parents are in the hospital, your child is being bullied at school, something is happening, how do you deal with that? You discover that your partner um, is ill in some important way. You know? So you, <clears throat> we, we need those kinds. But if someone wants to go beyond those kinds, the book also is really helpful because in a very secular and practical way, it's a real inquiry about how do we reduce the underlying neurobiological engine of craving 
Um, so it's kind of like a mental muscle um, that you can develop, kind of like develop biceps, go to the gym, develop biceps. You can develop mental toughness or mental um, resilience um, through all these strategies that you're talking about. I hear you uh, talk about, um, uh, you know, things like taking in good, for example, um, which I think is a powerful thing because um, our brain is naturally drawn towards negative things. Yeah. Versus positive. Can you talk a little bit about what taking in good uh, means to you? Sure. And how does that help? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you a little story about myself. So, mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a very kind of normal family, but uh, because uh, of the way my parents were raised, and also because of the fact that I was very young going through school, and my nature is to be sort of shy and observant and a little nervous. Uh, I had many, many experiences of feeling that nobody wanted me really or understood me. And by the time I was 15 or so, I was really quite unhappy. And in my own mind, it was all sort of a mess. And I didn't feel hopeful at all. And then there were a series of experiences right around the time I was 15, I, I know roughly when this happened, when I realized that I could learn every day. Mm -hmm in the broadest sense. I don't mean learn algebra. I mean learn how to talk to a girl. <laughs> or learn not to get so irritated by my family. Or learn how to let go of these old feelings of worthlessness inside me. I could grow every day. And that was revelatory that we could grow, I could grow every day. So that's what I'm talking about here when I say taking in the good. I'm talking about growing every day. So how do we grow? We grow neuropsychologically in a two-stage process. And let's be really clear, if there's no lasting change in the brain, when, and by brain I really mean the nervous system and the body, but the primary organ of learning is right inside our head, but it's obviously part of the whole body. All right. So uh, how does the brain change for the better? It's a two-stage process. And remember that if there's no physical change, there's no growth. Right. That is... People should just stop and stare at that billboard. Anybody, by the way, who's involved in helping other people should just stop and stare at that like a big billboard. No change in the brain equals no gain. Hmm. There might be a momentary experience, but no lasting value. Period. Stop. Like, wow. And just as a quick sidebar, I think that in the general profession, certainly of psychology broadly, which I would include, let's say, coaching as well as psychotherapy and counseling. And then adding to that human potential, which I've been very involved in, self-help, personal development, and also uh, mindfulness training, self-compassion training. Um, those sorts of uh, endeavors rarely ask how can people help themselves produce lasting change in their brain? So that when people go through a mindfulness training or a gratitude training or a stress management program, you're a physician works integratively. Let's people go through these um, wellness programs, uh, maybe after a, a heart attack, they go through some kind of stress management program. Um, there's a lot of evidence that most of those programs have very little benefit for the majority of the people who go through them. There are the super learners who are really helping them, themselves gain, but the middle and then lower third of the distribution, the, divide the distribution of people in three groups, the lower two thirds, very little lasting value. And that's true for my profession as well, psychotherapy. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity here for us to really focus on how to help people engage positive neuroplasticity to produce lasting change when they go through any kind of formal or informal process of healing or growth. So now that I've gotten that rant off my chest, I'll tell you how to do it. All right? It's a very simple two-stage process. First, whatever we want to grow inside. So let's say you want to help your child grow self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Or let's say you want to help yourself grow patience or self-worth. Or you want to really become more, uh, feel more confident when you're leading a meeting at work or giving a talk. Whatever you want to grow, you must begin by experiencing. Mm. You must get some kind of pattern of activation going in the nervous system. 
some momentary coalition of neurons and synapses and neurochemicals coming together that support the experience of self-worth, patience, confidence, et cetera. Okay, you begin with the experience. If the brain is like a iPod or a jukebox, you know, because I'm old, uh, you first begin with the song playing. You have to start with the experience, okay? Right. But then you have to turn on the recorder. This is the second necessary step, without which no learning, mm -hmm. no growth. You must leave a lasting change of neural structure and, and or function. Otherwise, by definition, you left all that money on the table. There's no lasting value. So how do we do that second stage? There are multiple factors that help the, learn, the, help the brain learn from beneficial experiences. As you said earlier, negative experiences, the brain is primed to learn very quickly because yeah. as our ancestors evolved, negative experiences had usually more urgency and impact on raw survival. You have to jump first. You know, get away from the tiger. Uh, if you go hungry today, you'll find some food tomorrow. But if you do not avoid that predator today, <laughs> no more food forever, right? So that kind of learning goes in fast. And we all experience that. <coughs> you know, you, you go through your day and 10 things happen, nine are good, one is bad. What do you remember when you go to sleep? It's the bad one. You have a weird, you know, you, go, you have a relationship, right? 10 things happen with your, your, your spouse, your partner, your boss. Uh, one is awkward, nine are good. It's the awkward one you think about. It had a lot of research on this. So how do we help the positive sink in, the beneficial moment of feeling strong or that you're worthy or that you're confident or you know how to do something? Well, there are multiple factors. Um, I have a whole model of this. I summarize it as in the HEAL acronym, H-E-A-L. Very briefly, it stands for have the experience. That's the first of the two stages of learning. Have the experience and then enrich it, E for enrich, by staying with it for a breath or longer, feeling it in your body, maybe recognizing what's personally relevant about it. And then A for absorb in the HEAL acronym, intend and sense that it's sinking in. And also focus on what's rewarding about it, because if you focus on what's rewarding about this moment of self-compassion or self-worth or commitment to exercising more uh, or eating less cookies, uh, uh, when you're fewer cookies, when you uh, uh, focus on what's rewarding about an experience, that increases activity of dopamine and norepinephrine in your brain, especially in the hippocampus. And so that then flags the experience at the time uh, for a priority in consolidation and storage. It's a keeper. In other words, if it's rewarding, this is the kind of thing you ought to really register. So focus on what's rewarding about it. And all that I'm saying lasts a breath or two or three. Mm. But if we don't give it that half a breath, at least a few seconds, there's not enough time, speaking generally, for the uh, pattern that's activated neurologically in short-term memory buffers to have much opportunity at all or likelihood to become transferred slowly but surely into long-term storage. And that, that's wonderful. That's uh, great advice, uh, Rick. Um, so what you're saying is um, when we see something good, our tendency is just to cruise through it, but yeah. pause and let it sink in. And only then your brain will see the, the beneficial effects of it. Pretty much. And what I want to be really clear here is that <clears throat> um, I'm not just talking about smell the roses. Hmm. That's the easy thing. And that is true. Why not smell the roses? I like talking with you. Why not notice it? I like seeing the Buddha above your head. Why not notice it? But, it, but focusing on that makes it easy to trivialize what I'm talking about and turn it into happy, smiley, fake it till you make it, positive thinking, which I don't believe in at all. I'm talking here about the fundamental process of acquiring inner uh, resources of various kinds. How do you actually acquire, acquire skillfulness with other people? How do you acquire emotional intelligence? There are all these buzzwords flying around. Mindfulness this, self-compassion that, gratitude, um, you know, don't worry so much, don't sweat the small stuff, uh, be more skillful, secure attachment, 
and it's all good. Mm -hmm. But we don't focus on how to actually acquire it in a lasting way and including uh, fortitude, grit. We talk about grit. We, there's tremendous research now on what are called character strengths and that research is about identifying them and using them. But it's almost nothing about learning them. True. How do you acquire gratitude? How do you acquire generosity? How do you acquire thrift? How do you acquire any of the so-called 24 character strengths that are routinely listed? Almost no attention to that at all. So that's what I'm really trying to stress here. And one way that this is, um, so if, you, I'll, if you'll permit me, I'll give you a 10-minute challenge. It's probably closer to five minutes. It's a five-minute challenge every day. Call it five minutes. Here you go. Three things. Here's the five-minute challenge. Can you, give your, can you give your mental health? Can you give your happiness? And, and think about the benefits for other people. Do it for your kids. Do it for your, your family if you can't do it for yourself. Number one, as you go through the day, a handful of times every day, just like you said, slow down to take in the good. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of methods you can use in your brain. To do this, I'll name the top three for me. Stay with the experience for a breath or longer. Feel it in your body. Focus on what's rewarding about it. It's inside your mind. No one can stop you. you don't, they don't need to know you're doing it. You know what I mean? But you, if you do that, you will notice immediately. Stay with it for a breath or longer. Feel it in your body. Focus on what feels good about it or is meaningful about it to you. Just doing that, you will feel different. And that, what I'm describing, takes eight or nine seconds. How long is a single breath for most people? Mm. Not that long. Um, okay, so number one of the five-minute challenge, you go through your day, take in the good a handful of times a day. And when you start committing to that, it'll change your whole day because then you'll spend your day looking for good things. <laughs> and good for you. Most of them will be small. You'll walk out the door and you'll see something Interesting. You'll see a bird, a flower, a funny thing, and you'll just go, okay. Or you'll go, thank you, I'm alive. Right? Or the hot dog vendor smiles at you when you get your lunch. Great. You know? Okay. Second, pick one thing you're trying to grow inside yourself these days that will really help you. Maybe it would help you to... Uh, remember to stay out of stupid arguments with your teenagers. Maybe it would help you to um, grow a commitment to staying on your diet or doing your exercise program or listening to your doctor, <laughs> right? Whatever it might be. No one thing that you're trying to grow these days. And in the book, Resilient, I talk a lot about uh, figuring out what would be good to grow based on the needs these days that are being challenged. So that, that's a good book to look into for that information. But often there's an intuition. What well, would be good to grow? Often the thing that's good to grow is to fill up an empty place inside that was left empty because of our childhood or our first marriage or our first job or the, the kids or something. Maybe we came to a new country and um, we were – you know, never very popular in school, whatever. I would, that was true for me. There was a big hole in my heart. How do you fill that hole in your heart? So you can listen to the longings in your heart. What would you like to feel inside? Deep down, admit it to yourself. Be strong enough to admit it to yourself. And then look for opportunities each day to fill your, that hole in your heart a few drops a day. Hmm. A drop is small, but a few drops a day for many days, you gradually fill the bucket. You gradually fill up the hole in your heart. So that's the second thing in my five-minute challenge. So look for an experience every day of something that's important to you to grow. Value it. Slow down to take it in. All right? Now I'm up to about three minutes. Two, maybe I'm up to two minutes a day so far. Then, last, <clears throat> in the five-minute challenge, every day for a minute or more, drop into what I call the green zone, deep green, in which for that minute, you set aside all your cares, your body might be in pain, there might be worry around the edges, but in the core of your being, 
you just let it go and you help yourself come into a felt sense in the moment of a sufficiency of needs met for this minute. In this minute, I am safe enough. Mm -hmm. In this minute, I am satisfied enough and I am connected enough. So that as my body calms, my mind increasingly has a sense in it of peace and contentment and love in terms of those three needs. And I'm resetting myself. This is, by the way, very good, as you know, as an integrative physician for physical health, to spend that minute or two or three every day where you drop into deep green. Really important, because we spend so much of our days um, in modern societies in the red zone. Uh, not running from tigers about to eat us, but running from meeting to meeting, multitasking, dealing with pressures, shifting gears, worrying about stuff, trying to, you know, comparing ourselves to other people, needing to impress other people all day long. We live in the pink zone, maybe not the red zone, but certainly the pink zone most of the time. And on any given day, that's okay. We're tough critters, you know, we're at the top of the food chain for a reason. But long term, there's tremendous gradual wear and tear of the red zone on body, mind, and relationships. And so it's very important to know what it feels like to drop into deep green. And then as you repeatedly do that, you will grow the trait of a profound inner calm, inner peace, and you will develop trait, inner peace, inner contentment, and inner love. So that's the summary, five minutes. And uh, it's also important to teach our kids, um, right, from the time they're young. Um, I'm part of my city, Dublin's uh, wellness committee, DUSD wellness committee, and we talk about stress amongst kids all the time. Yeah. And yeah. I've learned a couple of things from you and which we um, uh, implement uh, in our mm. home. Uh, my, um, so, so the rule is if you want to complain about something or somebody or of a situation, then it has to be followed by three positive things. <laughs> middle That's interesting. Sucks, Good. For example, you know, okay, middle school sucks. What are the things uh, that you like about middle school? And then my daughter would come up with a list of things that she loves. And that's when she realizes, oh, no, it's not that bad after all. Ah, so good it, for you. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of gives them – uh, gives them a platform to uh, realize that it's not all bad out there. You know, the negativity bias that you talk about, our brain is constantly scanning for threats and uh, for um, negative experiences, but um, that's because it's, you know, it's it built in us, uh, our ancestors had to survive and all, but we don't have to live with that negativity bias. That's right. The way my, my expression for it, as you know, is we have a brain that's like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good ones. Oh, there you and, go. Yeah, that really summarizes it. And so what we can do is we can gradually help it become like Velcro for good experiences, beneficial experiences, and Teflon for bad ones. And a very important point here, first, as we do this, it helps us deal with the bad better. Hmm. We become more able to um, handle challenges and threats and difficulties. We become more confident in being strong with other people when we need to be. And we feel more resourced ourselves. It's like our cup is full. So naturally then, we become more interested in altruism and generosity and um, cooperation with other people. So that's good and you know we could say deep you could say spiritual but it's really psychological sense when you feel increasingly full inside you're just not disturbed by life you don't approach life with a sense of something missing and something wrong which is the biological basis for craving mm -hmm. you don't feel the need to crave it's like I'm good. I'm okay already. I'm engaged with life. I want to help. And in this moment, no problem. I think of the body. Uh, I know we're going to finish soon. I'll just say that running through a lot of what we're talking about for me is responsibility that 
we have to take responsibility for ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, I was reading recently a translation of the Buddha's last words, as best we know, basically saying, um, uh, you know, he says, uh, you know, things fall apart, keep walking your path. Mm. You know, keep walking your path. And uh, it's on you, it's your path, and you have to keep walking. So there's a theme here of responsibility. No one can stop us from growing and learning. No one can do it for us. Mm -hmm. On the other major theme, though, is a kindness for ourselves, a sweetness that we come into a kind of tenderness. We realize, wow, this poor little body, <laughs> so scared, so vulnerable, so prone to aging, illness, and death. You know, ugh. Uh, I want to help that. I want to help it calm down, you know, like a horse or a dog that's scared. Calm it down, calm it down. Feed it, feed it psychologically, not just physically. Uh, be kind to it. It's very important. So there's a, there's a, for me, there's a combination in what I'm saying that's tough-minded. You got to do the work. You got to grow the muscles for the challenges of life for other people as well as yourself. Don't, don't mess around. Yeah. Got to do it on the one hand. On the other hand, the other aspect of this, though, is very loving, very kind toward oneself, very compassionate, very understanding of what it feels like in the inside out and what, uh, what you long for and what you really need. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I guess it sounds like it's possible to... Um, if we change our mind, it's possible to change our brain. Yeah. And then it's possible to change our mind again <laughs> for the better. And, uh, you know, grow new neurons and uh, positive neuroplasticity. As they say, neurons that fire together, wire together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this was all uh, great information, Rick. Thank you so much. Oh, completely a pleasure. And people um, should check out my website, rickhanson.net rickhanson.net, tons of freely offered resources there, information, talks, okay. videos, little short things people can immediately use for everyday life. Plus, I have a number of really excellent online programs that are uh, well-organized, really accessible. You can do them on your own anytime you want, including just listening to them on your phone uh, while you're going for a walk or driving to work. Um, so I would say check out that, rickhanson.net. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you. you. Great things. And I hope you continue to do so. And can't wait for your uh, sixth book. Uh -huh. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So guys, we saw that it's possible to be resilient. It's possible to learn to bounce back after an adversity. Um, in fact, Rick in his book, Resilient, talks about 12 inner strengths we all can develop in order to be resilient. To name a few, these are grit, calm, courage, and so on. We also saw that we all have negativity bias in us, thanks to our ancestors. It was a survival instinct. The negativity bias shows up in a lot of ways. For example, studies have found that in a relationship, it typically takes five good interactions to make up for a single bad one. In our house, the rule is if my husband messes up, he has to come up with 10 and not five. But we don't have to accept this uh, negativity bias. We saw that today. We also saw taking in good how that helps develop our, or cultivate a skill. So pick a skill you want to grow. For example, courage. When, now, whenever you encounter an experience that makes you feel courageous, stay with it for some time, for a couple of breaths. Also recognize if your brain gets in the red zone, check a few times a day. Leave red as soon as possible. Take a couple of deep breaths. Think of something that makes you feel safe. Pick a thought of all rightness and stay with it. And if you can go all the way to the green, that's okay, even if you can get in the yellow zone. So guys, it's very much possible to change your brain for better health and happiness. Hope you found these tools useful. What tools would you like to implement in your life? You can put in the comment below. Take care. See you next time.